Despite intensive antiplatelet therapy, patients with coronary and or peripheral artery disease exhibit a high residual risk of atherothrombotic events. Evidence from anti-10A therapy, in addition to standard therapy, supports the use of a direct oral factor 10A inhibitor in reducing morbidity and mortality in patients with acute coronary syndrome when combined with antiplatelets. Our discussion today focuses on the available factor 10A inhibitors and potential uses in cardiovascular disease. I'm Dr. Deepak Bhatt, the Executive Director of Interventional Cardiovascular Programs and a Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Joining me today are Dr. John Eichelboom, a professor in the Division of Hematology and Thromboembolism of the Department of Medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and Dr. Vamsi Krishna, an interventional cardiologist and endovascular specialist at Ascension Medical Group in Kyle, Texas, and Dr. Manesh Patel, the chief of the Division of Cardiology and a member of the Duke Clinical Research Institute in Durham, North Carolina. Thanks for joining us. Let's begin. So there's a lot to talk about today on our plate, and I think it will hopefully be an interesting discussion for the audience. Maybe we can just start off with the basics. In my intro there, I was talking about atherothrombosis. I like the term, but uh, maybe we can start off with a discussion of what the difference is between atherosclerosis and atherothrombosis. Is there meaning to those words? Yeah, maybe I'll start, and I'm sure others can jump in too, uh, Deepak. I think the, the, you know we, we went through a period in time when we thought of everything as atherosclerosis. It's important to remember that in medical school or even the earliest observations were pathology, where we looked at the arteries and saw yellow streaky lipid content in people's arteries. Mm -hmm. And so that led to this idea of hardening of the arteries and atherosclerosis, where in fact the cells have some lipid material and a variety of other compounds laid down over a lifetime of exposure, but unfortunately starts young in age. The addition of thrombosis is really important because that's how the pathology happens and that atherosclerosis may be occurring, but most often whether it's a heart attack, a stroke, often even thrombosis in the limbs, there is actually a disruption to that atherosclerosis that then starts to trigger the thrombotic events that lead to either an, a full occlusion of that vessel or at least downstream embolization. And so I think it's a, it's a really nice way of thinking about both the biology of the underlying disease process, but then the acute manifestations. I, I don't know, John, if that's no. a good description. You're the hematologist. Yeah, keep us know. honest. Was, uh, yeah, was keep that really true? my <laughs> interventional description. <laughs> no, no, it's a great description. If there is such a thing as elegant pathology, mm -hmm. then maybe atherothrombosis is the phrase to describe it because we have a pristine vessel which is injured by some exposure to some injurious agent, uh, as a response, the, the vessel uh, gets damaged and then it exposes subendothelial proteins, it releases tissue factor and it starts to stimulate coagulation. So even when you don't have overt thrombosis sitting there, your coagulation system starts ramping up, your platelets start getting a bit fired up. And then there is a sequence of events that can lead to subclinical thrombosis to clinical thrombosis. So it's, it's sort of a continuum combining that response to injury with a th thrombus form. And, and let me ask you, and, and you're probably the most qualified here, there's, you know, what we learned in medical school, the coagulation cascade, and Vamsi is still having nightmares about that, by the way, so, you know, be gentle in your depiction of this, but, you know, there's a coagulation cascade, there are the platelets, and they're doing this here, and they're doing this there, but they're much more intermingled in real life, of course. How, how do they all interplay, the platelets and the... Uh... That's a terrific point, because, because when we are taught this in medical school, we could be forgiven for believing that they're totally disparate pathways that at some stage sort of marry together at critical moments, but it's all happening at the same time. And I like to think of coagulation actually as incredibly simple. It's like this Y of two, you know, intrinsic, extrinsic, which already gives horrors to everyone. But then everything leads to a common pathway where thrombin is generated and thrombin leads to platelet activation and to fibrin formation, the two key components of every thrombus. You've always got fibrin, you've always got platelets, and in fact, at no stage through this process do you independently activate platelets or independently 
uh, generate thrombin, they're, uh, they're very closely linked. Yeah, I think that provides a good basis of how potentially antiplatelet and or anticoagulant therapy can be useful in atherothrombotic conditions. You know, some people say, well, you know, atherosclerosis, atherothrombosis, it's all going away anyway. What do you think, Bomsi? What are you seeing out there on the front lines? Is, have we conquered atherosclerosis and atherothrombosis? I think we've made uh, good strides. Um, I think with, you know, st statin and non-statin therapies to help control some of our, our cholesterol uh, you know, in new medications like Vasipa out there to help with triglycerides and other uh, molecules out there. I think we're, we're making good strides. I, I do think it's important that we use the word atherothrom atherothrombotic because when we're talking about continued residual risk, I think, you know, especially as interventionalists, we fix, we acutely fix an issue. We determine, you know, the duration of antiplatelet therapy. We kind of do what we call goal-directed medical therapy, and then it's you're off your medications. But really, the reality is, is that there is a constant diffuse state of disease going on, and that there are these endpoints of you know, having a stroke, having a heart attack, or having some limb event is real. And what therapies are we really using, and how are you defining it in trials? I think using this atherothrombotic endpoints are really important for the community to understand.